Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the University of Suffolk Facebook Live. My name is Karen Hinton. I'm going to be hosting the session today. Um, and we're here to talk all things clearing and kind of getting started at university as well, if you apply to do clearing. Um, as usual, you're welcome to ask us questions. Just use the, the comments to stick some questions in. We'll try and get through as many as we can today. Um, we're taking questions about all aspects of applying over the summer, um, getting your re results over the summer, what happens next, and for those of you who already have a place at Suffolk, you're obviously also very welcome to ask us questions about preparing to get started. Um, so I'm going to get everybody to introduce themselves first. I'm going to go in alphabetical order. So Holly, would you like to go first? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Holly and I'm the admissions manager here at the University of Suffolk. Um, so looking after your applications when they come in, liaising with academics um, and hopefully make sure that we can make you an offer to study with us. Thanks, Holly. Jenny? Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Dunn. I'm one of the Student Life Advisors. Um, you may have heard of us called the InfoZone in the past. We are having a bit of a name change. So InfoZone, Student Life, same department. Um, we're here to answer any questions at all that we can help with. Um, and my specialist area is accommodation. I predict some questions on accommodation, Jenny. <laughs> We've already had some that come through this morning, actually. So we'll definitely bring those to you. Uh, Louise, would you like to go next? Okay. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dr Louise Carter, I'm one of the lecturers in history. Thanks Louise. Nigel? Hello there, my name is Nigel Ball, I'm course leader for graphic design, but I'm also head of arts uh, within the School of Engineering, Arts, Science and Technology. So any questions about any of the arts courses, I will hopefully be able to um, answer them for you. Great, thanks Nigel and Sophie. Hello, I'm Sophie and I'm from Colchester and I've just finished my third year studying early and primary education studies. Great, thanks Sophie. So lots of student life questions to come your way through the next wee while. Um, these uh, sessions normally last for about 45 minutes to an hour just depending on the questions that are coming through. Um, so just make sure you get your questions in early so we can try to include everything. I'm going to start off with Holly because obviously one of the key things um, at this time of year that everybody's talking about is clearing and late applications um, and kind of what clearing actually means. So Holly, can you just tell us, just remind us, what is clearing and how does it work? Right, okay. Um, so essentially clearing is late application. So there's two stages to it. Um, it starts usually at the beginning of July and some institutions will start recruiting them and taking applications. Um, and then you also get clearing where individuals who have applied to university in the normal cycle, so through UCAS, um, want to make an application because they maybe haven't met the conditions of their original offer. So that's when you think of clearing as a level results day. So it's for different groups of people. So you might be someone who hasn't thought about applying to university before and actually it's got to the summer and you're like, that seems like a good idea. It's something that comes September I'd really like to do. Um, or like I said, when you get your results on A-level results day on the 10th of August, you might not quite meet the conditions of your original offer um, and want to look at other institutions that might accept you or you might have changed your mind about what you want to study and where you want to go. Um, in clearing, rather than going through UCAS, you contact your chosen university directly, um, usually by phone, but they might have an online form, and they'll ask a few questions about um, your personal contact details so we can get in touch with you, um, a bit of information about your qualifications, and then depending on the course, you might need to provide an electronic portfolio for something like graphic design, for example, or attend an interview, but usually the process is much quicker um, and it'll all usually be online. So you'll probably speak to someone um, and then you'll get an offer, hopefully, um, within a couple of days, unless there's more information that the university needs. So it's much quicker and it's usually also for the September intake. So we are taking applications now for September 2021 start date. Great, thanks Holly. Um, we've had a question then already asking about what time you're starting to answer the phones on A-level results day because everybody always worries that it's going to be um, a bit busy. And uh, alongside that, it, it also be really helpful if you can just tell everybody, is it a mad dash? Because everybody always <laughs> assumes it's going to be done really quickly. So do we need to yeah. be on the phone straight away as soon as the phone lines open? I Okay, so we at the University of Suffolk will be 
answering the phones from 8am on A-level results day, but it's important to remember UCAS release results under embargo. So you probably won't have your A-level results or your reform BTEC results if you're waiting for those until after 8.30. So we're here to answer the phone and have a chat with you if you want to from that time. I'd say that on results day, it might seem like a rush and like there's lots of pressure to kind of get a place and commit, but just I think it's pretty important to kind of take a step back, have a look at what your options are, make sure you know what your grades are um, before you kind of commit and call universities. There'll be lots of universities with places available and lots of different courses that you might want to have a think about. So check the UCAS website for full course listings, go onto individual university websites to find out a bit more about the courses that are available and make sure that you're making an informed choice. Um, of course, the sooner you get in touch, the sooner you can get an offer, but just make sure you're having a think about it and really make sure it's the right choice for you before you kind of dive straight in. Great, thanks. And I'm going to ask you one more question before I come to the other. <laughs> um, the people who are watching who are already holding offers for Suffolk, if they've not quite hit the conditions of their offer, should they be phoning us on A-level results day as well? Probably not. Um, hopefully, we will have got your results already. So we will actually, as universities, receive A-level and Reform BTEC results before you do as students. Um, so we will have those over the coming weeks. So we'll be reviewing those and checking the grades you've achieved against your original offer. And if you don't quite meet the conditions, we'll look at your personal statement. We'll look at your interview and your portfolio if you have those to find out if we can still accept you. So by the time you get your results on A-Level Results Day, you should be able to log on to UCAS Track and see if you've been accepted or not. Um, and if we've accepted you, we'll send you a nice email congratulating you as well. If we haven't accepted you, you will see that as well. So unfortunately, it'll show as an unsuccessful decision. In a very small number of cases, we might not be able to make the decision. And that's probably because we've got your results and they're not quite what you're expecting. But before we make our final decision, we'd like to have a chat with you. So if that's the case, if you look on track and there's nothing there, don't panic. We will probably be in touch with you. I'd say if you haven't heard from us probably by the next day, that's the time to maybe give us a call um, and find out kind of what's going on and what you need to do next. Excellent. Thank you, Holly. Um, when you were chatting that you were talking, you mentioned e-portfolios. So, Nigel, I have to ask you, what's an e-portfolio? What do you expect to see in it? That's a really good question. And it will depend uh, slightly uh, on the arts course. Um, for graphic design, I can t uh, talk um, very clearly about that. We're looking to see your creativity in its broadest sense. I don't particularly like giving a tick list of things we like to see because we like to treat the individual um, and their creativity as broadly as we can. And we know what we're looking for. So really in graphic design, if you're applying for a graphic design course, then maybe if you've been working in typography, application of color, some drawing skills and things like that are all good things to see. Um, I wouldn't restrict your portfolio just to things you've been doing at school or on, on a college course either. So anything that you've been doing outside of um, your education, then that's really good to see as well. So, um, but I'm not a fan of tick lists when it comes to portfolios because that can put some people off from actually applying to us and sending in a portfolio. Um, so it's more about uh, trying to gauge what your creative sense is overall uh, within graphic design. For some of the other courses, um, they might need some specific things that they're looking for. Um, um, if they've got specific areas of interest, such as architecture, which is a very specific um, um, remit, and you should be able to find all of the information about what's expected in the portfolio on their course web pages. And if you can't find the information, then just get in touch with the course leaders or the contact, um, and they will be able to advise you as to what to go into a portfolio. But generally, it's about looking at your creativity and uh, where your ideas come from and, and some of your core skills. Um, and in e-portfolio, it can sound daunting to some people, especially if you're not overly um, technical, technological 
technologically familiar with things and how to put those things together. Separate images would be fine. Um, so it doesn't all have to be collected together in a PowerPoint or PDF slides or something like that. If you can collate all the images together you want to send to us into one file, then that's great for us. Um, but at the end of the day, if they're separate JPEGs or something like that that you send through as separate emails, we can deal with that as well. At the end of the day, we don't want to put any barriers in place. Um, what we want to do is, is just we, we will work with whatever you can send us. OK, I hopefully that's covered everything. But if there's any other questions, I'll be pleased to help. Cool. Thanks, Nigel. Um, we've put a link up on the in the comments um, about how to submit any portfolio. So hopefully that'll help any pers prospective arts applicants out there. Louise, if you end up speaking to applicants during clearing as one of our academic uh, team, is that basically an interview or is it something a bit more informal? It's definitely something more informal. Um, and it's as much about the applicant trying to see whether we're a good fit for them as much as them seeing whether we're a good uh, fit and vice versa. So um, it slightly depends on who the applicant is and what their kind of immediate backstory is. So if we're talking about someone who has very recently been taking uh, examinations and has some very kind of recent results to discuss, that sort of um, uh, one thing that we can kind of talk about, you know, what their particular interests are, are there particular things that happened this year? There may be <laughs> some very particular things that happened this year um, that, that may have kind of influenced the, the results that they got. Um, we can talk about the particular modules that we teach and what sorts of things they are interested in and whether that seems like a good kind of fit, whether there's someone who really kind of likes um, sort of small and getting to know everybody and the kind of feeling of community that we absolutely have to offer at Suffolk or whether they're really kind of looking for you know big city experience and and sort of a bit more sort of anonymity and sort of crowds of 300 in a, in a lecture hall um, type experiences so if it's somebody who's sort of more recently been in study it's much more of a chat talking about what the course involves, what's going to be sort of expected in year one, year two, year three, what sorts of things they can kind of go on and, and do in, in careers and just kind of trying to make sure we've got a good fit there. What we also get during the clearing period is sometimes people who are returning to study after a big, big break. Um, and um, that often kind of involves a little bit more just kind of trying to get a bit of a sense of um, when their most recent study was um, and in those sorts of cases it, it's slightly more interview um, but but certainly still not a sort of um, a grilling it's never a grilling um, it, it's just a sort of um, again kind of trying to work out what their expectation of university is um, what the kind of time commitment they are anticipating it being whether maybe they've had a job that's involved some sort of written work and um, things that we can kind of use we're always looking i mean i think the key thing is we're always looking for reasons to say yes we're absolutely not going in there kind of looking to kind of you know put black marks against people and kind of you know um rule them out so we're always kind of trying to say you know what kind of voluntary work have you been involved in what kind of um work have you been involved in and looking for kind of reasons to say okay well you know that sounds like there's a, there's a foundation there even if you have been out of study for a while excellent thanks louise um i need to pick up a question that came through a few minutes ago from claire sorry it's been a wee while to get back to, to your question claire um but claire's um asking what happens if she wants to change her mind if she's already accepted a, a place elsewhere she's particularly interesting interested in staying closer to home Probably a question for you, Holly. Um, what, what happens in that situation? Yeah, so it's not a problem at all. Um, if you've accepted a place elsewhere, then I guess the first thing to do is have a think about actually what it is that you want to do and where you might want to go. And once you've figured out which university and course you want to do, give them a call and find out if they have places first off. I'd always say don't rush to kind of withdraw your place or decline an offer elsewhere just because you don't know what might happen at your new choice. Um, but get in touch with them, have a chat with them. If they can make you an offer, that's the point at which you probably want to get in touch with your previous institution and kind of say, actually, I don't want to study with you anymore. I need to decline or withdraw my place. 
Um, and that will then enable you to accept an offer with your second choice institution and go through UCAS track to accept it. Um, so I just say, as we said before, make sure you make an informed choice, don't rush into anything um, and only kind of commit to withdrawing from your other choice if you know you've got a place elsewhere. But it's absolutely not a problem. And I think many universities, including the University of Suffolk, will be really pleased to have a chat with you and, and talk through the options. Um, and us, of course, we'd love you to come to us by ringing us up and making an inquiry. You're not committing to anything. You're not tied into anything at that stage. Um, so just have a chat with us and we'll see what we can do. Thanks, Holly. Um, somebody's commented that there's problems with the audio. We think it's all working well, so um, hopefully everybody can hear us. Um, I just want you to continue that one with you, Holly, just for a second. In terms of how people actually confirm that they're wanting to come to us, are they having to send in certificates? Are they signing up in blood? What, what actually happens? How do they commit? <laughs> There is no blood involved, hopefully. <laughs> so if you um, get in touch with us and we make you an offer, in your offer email through clearing, there'll be instructions on how you can accept it. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail on how, because it's slightly different depending on whether you've applied through UCAS in the normal cycle, whether you haven't, if you want part-time or full-time study. So your offer email will have a paragraph or two really quite clearly outlining how you respond to the offer and it'll link to any relevant forms or external websites that you need to go to. Um, I'd say it is important if you want to accept or to decline that you get in touch with us as soon as possible. Um, if you decide you don't want to accept an offer, we, we obviously want to know kind of what's happening. We hope you'll be coming to study with us. So you do send us an email. If you want to accept and you're not sure, you can give us a call directly and we can put the number in the chat um, and we can kind of talk through what it is that you need to do. But once you've accepted um, and after results, they will then get in touch with you to hopefully progress you through to enrolment. For different courses, there might be a few things that you need to do. Um, so we usually ask that you send us evidence of your highest qualifications. Um, and for something like a health program, we'll probably also send you a DBS form to fill out, um, an occupational health questionnaire. And we'll probably also ask for evidence of a few different qualifications like GCSEs. So if we ask for um, evidence of certificates or other things like that, it's important you send them to us as soon as possible, because obviously that will mean we can get you through to enrollment and you can get started on your course. And can someone just literally take a photo of their certificate and send it to us? Yep, so you can take a photo, you can scan it in, and then you can just email to admissions at uos.ac.uk. Brilliant, thanks Holly. Um, I really want to get on to a bit about accommodation and things, but I must ask the question that Patsy's put in first, um, which is about the class sizes and graphic design. Nigel, can you say a little bit about class sizes for graphics, but also generally for our arts courses? Absolutely. Thank you, Patsy, for your, for your question. Um, yeah, on graphic design, the class sources, uh, class sizes, if I could speak, um, are generally what I would consider to be small. Um, we typically, it, it, uh, to give you a number, then relatively around about 25 per year is what we're looking at. Um, sometimes it might go a little bit over that, sometimes it might go a little bit below that, depending on uh, what sort of uh, year there has been. Um, we, we like that personal touch with teaching. Most graphic design studios, when you enter the uh, the industry will be um, relatively small on that sort of uh, basis. It'd be rare that you'd find a, a studio practice or an agency where there's there's vast numbers of people uh, with working within the studio, but particularly as graphic designers anyway. Um, and so you might find some very large advertising agencies or things like that that employ a lot of people. But mostly what we're trying to do on the course is replicate the sort of like the industry experience. And so having large cohort wouldn't really... Uh, uh, work with that. At the end of the day, we want you to leave our course with um, as much ability to go straight into the industry as possible and for that industry experience to be as close to what we can uh, make it within um, our studio when we're working with you so that there's no big shock for when you go into the industry and it all seems very familiar to you. Um, so that that and that personal approach is really important. In terms of one of the things that I always like to say is that 
within two weeks, I like to know every student's name that's on the course as course leader and to be able to address you um, by your first name. And um, I can do that with a class size of about 25. Um, if there's class sizes of, of over 100, I've got no idea how I'll remember your name. So so just that, that personal touch is something that we, we like to engender. And that's the same across all of the arts courses. So while I can speak specifically about graphic design experience there, um, the, all of the arts courses uh, at the University of Suffolk are very similar in that approach. So, so yes, I hope that's answered your question. Great, thanks, Nigel. Um, Sophie, you were in early in primary education studies, and uh, which is now part of our childhood studies course. What was did did your academics know your name? Yeah, so um, you get a personal tutor as well when you start. Um, so you can go to them about anything um, you're struggling with. Like, it doesn't have to be about academic, if, like home life. Um, you can go to them. Um, so yeah, again, like Nigel said, you have a lot smaller class sizes. So the lecturers do get to know your name and you're like a name rather than a number at the University of Suffolk. That's nice. Um, Louise, you also mentioned the size, I think, of the cohort when you were speaking. What's, what's it usually like in history? We average about um, 20 um, in, in sort of first year. Uh, it can, when you get into sort of options in second and third year, it can go a little bit smaller than that because people are choosing the, the things that they're taking. But absolutely the same as uh, Nigel and, and Sophie have been saying that I think that's one of our absolute kind of assets at, at Suffolk that um, it, it's students in the past have sort of said, you know, that they they felt like they were part of the family sort of by the end of the week, really. Um, and it's it's not just us getting to know your name which of course is really important from our perspective but it's also students getting to know each other's names so you you know everybody on day one there is that little bit of kind of like oh i'm going to university for the first time i don't know anyone but our absolute um goal is that by day two you're saying oh there's joe let you know let's kind of go and, and, and have a coffee so that it's not just that we know each other i think one of the really really lovely things and you can see it all the way through the degree you can see it when people are you know uh, doing dissertation research and things and, and they're uh, needing a kind of little bit of light relief the fact that you get this really lovely cohort who all know each other i think is is as important if not maybe more important dare i say it than the fact that you get to know us well and we get to know you well you get to know your classmates really well yeah i think you're absolutely right i think across the university the largest groups that we would tend to have is in the social sciences where you might have maybe 60 to 70 on a single route um and sometimes a few more in a lecture theater when there's some joints but pretty much across the whole university we try to keep class sizes at a a size that allows people to get to know each other. It's a real ethos for the university, isn't it? It's important. Uh, Nigel, before I go to conversation. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, just to <laughs> jump in there. I think just from the arts perspective, something else to consider with uh, class size as well is access to equipment and facilities as well. We have some specialist areas that have open access um, availability to them. So like our print room and our 3D room and things like that and our Mac suites um, to get into those and actually use those outside of talk time. And um, with some of the bigger courses, that can be quite difficult. At other, uh, at different universities that can be quite difficult to actually access that equipment so by keeping the the courses relatively personal and small means that you you also um on top of all the things about getting to know your cohort and getting to know your your uh, tutors and things it's about also being able to make sure you can get your hands on the kit that you need to to do the work that you do I mean, the, that kit is a really important part of people deciding to come and do arts courses and deciding which university to go to. Is there a chance for people to come and look around over the summer, Nigel, or are you and colleagues around to show people some of those facilities? Absolutely, yeah, we'll be around. We have an open day coming up on the 14th, I believe, is it? And one of the things I'm planning with the open day is to um, show as many people around who come to the open day around the arts building as possible. Um, our facilities are, you know, excellent. They are really, really good. And it'd be great if people could come and see those. But outside of the open event, then yes, as long as the lecturers will be, lecturers will be around and available to come and, and show you around. Um, so yeah, please get in touch and we can... Uh, organize something that's not a problem brilliant thanks Nigel Sophie I think you've been doing quite a few campus tours over the summer so far haven't you you'll be maybe doing a few more yeah 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 so you can book um, a campus tour to have um, so you don't necessarily get to meet a lecturer but you can meet a student and you can have a look around and get just a feel for the university as well 
Well, excellent. Don't worry, Nigel, we'll always tell you <laughs> where we've got your lot coming right. <laughs> um, Jenny, I've been meaning to get onto accommodation for a while, and poor Natasha asked a question five minutes ago, and, and we've, we've been off talking about other things. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about accommodation? Firstly, is accommodation still available for students who are applying through Clearing? Yes, it is, absolutely. And that's including the on-campus halls of residence known as Athena Hall as well, which tends to be the most popular choice for students who are, are new to us and new to the area. Yeah, so in a Athena Hall has um, shared flats, so four to seven uh, beds per flat uh, with a shared kitchen uh, communal area. Um, there are also studio rooms, um, studio flats available in Athena Hall. So if we have any mature students or any student couples coming to us, they might prefer that so they have a bit more privacy rather than having to share a kitchen with other people. Um, and then there's also a lot of off-campus accommodation that we can recommend as well. It's all been accredited by us. It's all been inspected by the council. So it's all properties and landlords that we trust. Um, so off-campus, there's a choice of ensuite rooms. Um, there's uh, another property that's halfway between ourselves and the hospital. So anybody on a placement to Ipswich Hospital, they might find that property uh, a little bit more convenient for them. And there's also some shared houses as well. Um, all accommodation is available to students of any year unless it's otherwise clearly labelled. Uh, we do tend to find Athena Hall is the more popular for the new students. But then once they reach the second and third year, they might have a little friendship group they want to live with. And that's where the houses really come into play. But it's completely up to the students where they choose to live. Excellent. And I mean, I think for lots of people thinking about clearing, I mean, there's the worry, first of all, that, you know, they've got to be quick to get a space on a course. And then there's the worry that um, they have to be quick to get a space and accommodation. What does the timing look like in terms of applying for accommodation and actually having a space confirmed? Yeah, so I would recommend once you've um, made your application for your course or spoken to admissions, if your situation has changed from what, how you originally applied, um, then absolutely have a look at the accommodation. You'll find all the information on our website. I think the link has just gone up there to our accommodation pages on our website. Um, you're all very welcome to have a look at the, the options that we recommend on there. On each page, there's details of how to contact the provider of that accommodation because it is all private accommodation rather than owned and managed by the university. Um, so you can get in contact with the providers just check what their availability is um, keep in touch with them but yeah there's absolutely there's no rush it's not one of these you know oh, oh my goodness I can get a place on the course but not in accommodation um, but yeah have a look at the course first but by all means you can contact those providers and just sort of set your mind at rest when you know what they've got available still. Great thanks Jenny. Um, Sophie am I right in thinking that you stayed in the on-campus accommodation? Yeah so when I was here, I uh, stayed at Athena Hall, and uh, with Athena Hall, you can actually stay there all three years, um, which most uh, other universities, you can only live in student accommodation for the first year, uh, so that's really handy. You don't have to worry about like trying to find somewhere else to go and live. Um, so with Athena Hall, it comes um, the same room sizes. Um, so every um, room comes with an ensuite, a small double bed, um, like wardrobe, desk, chair, and then the size of the room just changes. So it goes bronze, silver, and gold, and it's just um, floor space. So you just, obviously gold, you get lots of floor space and bronze, not so much, but you still get your ensuite, your double bed and things like that. Um, then obviously you get your kitchen and you've all got a cupboard each, space in the fridge each, space in the freezer. And it's a nice little sofa area as well that you can all go and hang out in as well. Um, it, so it is really nice accommodation. <laughs> And what about getting your washing done and stuff? Is, is there someone nearby to do that? Yeah, so um, there's downstairs, there's a, like a laundrette that you can go and take your um, clothes to. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously just pay some money and, yeah, get them washed I downstairs. I heard a rumour there's Amazon lockers now at Athena Hall, is that right? Yeah, so you can order your Amazon stuff straight into the building and you just go and get a code and then, like, a door swings open. <laughs> Full of loveliness. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Sounds good. Is it really noisy? Because it's it's quite a, a large accommodation block, isn't it? Does it have yeah. major parties? Um, in Freshers Week, I think everyone just gets a bit carried away. Uh, but the rest of the year is pretty quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and there's um after eleven o'clock, you're not allowed any noise anyway. Um, so after eleven, you're guaranteed it to be quiet. Guaranteed. Love it. You've heard it here first. <laughs> 
Um, Jenny, as well as accommodation, which obviously lots of people will be thinking about just now over the summer, um, what about finance? Is it is it getting a bit late to apply for finance? Can people still sort that if they're only confirming places at university in the coming few weeks? Absolutely, people can still apply for finance. Um, the sooner you apply for it, the more chance there is of it being in place for the first day of term. Uh, but even if it isn't in place, it wouldn't stop you from joining us anyway. Um, but yes, I think it's up to nine months after the start of the course you can apply for uh, finance. But obviously, if you leave it that late, what are you going to be living on? Um, so if it is something that you will be relying on, then yes, we do recommend apply for that as soon as possible. Um, you can do that online through the Student Finance England website, which is part of the gov.uk pages. I'm sure we'll put a link up for that as well. Mm -hmm. And if people want to find out information, particularly mature students with other responsibilities and, you know, worries about childcare and kind of managing all of the, the money side of coming to uni, um, where can people get advice about what they might be able to be eligible to apply for? So there's lots of information on our own website and also the Student Finance England website has um, lots and lots of information on as well. Um, there is uh, an extra help section on the Student Finance England website which details um, for students who might be parents or who might have um, adults dependent on them financially or if students have a disability there may be funding additional funding available for all those areas um, so the best thing I would suggest would be have a look at the website have a look at the student finance England website as well um, and for anybody on an NHS course uh, there may be additional funding through the NHS learning support fund as well um, another website for that one um, but yes there is a, a, a training grant on there there's also um, additional childcare support, um, exceptional circumstances. And if students are having to pay for um, secondary accommodation at a hospital placement or travel expenses, there's help with claiming that back as well. Cool, thanks Jenny. Um, I'm not doing very well at keeping up with the questions that are coming today. Um, we've got a, a good one from Amy about access course results. Um, everybody always talks about A-levels and maybe sometimes talks about VTECs. Being a Scot, nobody ever talks about the Scottish qualifications and we don't always mention access either. So, Holly, what about access? When do you get the access results? Yeah. So, we have received access results already. Um, they came through, I think, over on Wednesday night. Um, so, for anyone who um, applied to us who had an access course as a pending qualification, if you applied through UCAS, we should in theory have been sent your access results already. Um, I think we have processed quite a few of these because they are not under embargo like um, A-level and B-tech results. Um, so Amy, if you particularly haven't heard back about your access results, it might be because we're still reviewing your qualifications um, or if you haven't had an update on your cast track, you can send them to us directly or just give us a ring and we can look into it. But generally, yes, unless you have other conditions, so like um, English GCSE or Maths GCSE or equivalent, we hopefully will have updated your UCAS track with the outcomes at this point. Yeah, Holly, on the GCSEs, um, some of our students will have been doing level two qualifications of GCSEs alongside level three, and they might be holding conditions for those. Um, what happens for those students? When do you get those results through? Yeah, so we don't get every single result through UCAS. Um, so if you are doing level two qualifications, it's probably best that you send the results directly to us. Um, so we talked earlier about sending certificates. You can just send a scan or a photo of your result directly to the admissions email address. Um, and once we have it, we will upload that and update the conditions of your offer. Um, if you are doing qualifications where we don't get the results through UCAS, it's really important that you send those to us as soon as you have them. Um, if you have a conditional offer, we will we will get in touch with you to follow them up and we will keep getting in touch with you until we receive them because obviously we hope you're going to come and study with us. Um, but yes, we wouldn't be able to progress your application until we have those. So it's really important you send them as soon as you can. And Holly, sorry to stick with you just now, but um, I guess next week must be quite busy for the admissions team at the university. If people are sending emails in with results or, you know, just with questions about what happens next, how how long will it take normally for you to get back to them? It, it is busy. <laughs> so we're already starting to see an increase in emails coming into admissions. Um, we have lots of people working with us, so we have some of the student ambassadors with us um, supporting and the student recruitment team are supporting as well. So we'll get uh, 
respond to you as quickly as possible. Hopefully it'll be within a couple of days. Um, but like Karen said, as we get, we start to get more and more emails, it obviously takes a little bit longer. But if you haven't had a response, um, I'd always say, just call, give us a call and we'll try and look at it. Obviously, if you send another email, it might then take us a little time to get to the second email as well. So it's always better to call. Um, but I promise we will get back to everyone as quickly as we can. And it, it won't kind of affect your application because we will get through them all. Great, thank you. We've also got a um, an message in from somebody asking about their CAS, which I think Holly, you might be able to help with. So already um, passed the CAS interview and paid the CAS deposit. So for those of you who don't know what CAS is, it's, a, it's international applicants need to have a CAS as part of the process of coming to university. What's the situation for students in, in this particular situation, Holly? So we usually issue CASs. It's um, a confirmation of acceptance for studies, and it means a student can then apply for their student visa um, once we have all of the information that we require from you as an applicant um, in order that we think you'd have a successful visa application. Um, so if you've had a CAS interview and paid your CAS deposit, we might still need your financial documents, but I'd say probably this individual, I would maybe email us in to ask the question specifically and we can look at your individual circumstances. Um, but generally when we're issuing CASs, we'll usually keep in contact with you throughout the process so you kind of know what's happening. If you sent documents to us and we haven't got back to you, it's probably just because we're reviewing them, doing all the checks that we need to do, like um, checking the dates on them, checking the currency conversion, things like that. Um, and as soon as we have done all of that, we will send you a draft CAS to review um, to just confirm that you're satisfied with it before we issue with the CAS so you can apply for your visa. Great. Thanks, Holly. Um, so once people have applied through clearing and kind of done their finance and accommodation and things, I think the next big question for, for students will be about actually getting started and preparing for getting started. Um, Louise, have you got any advice for, for applicants coming in, you know, making a decision in clearing that they want to come to do history at Suffolk? What would you say they should be doing to prepare for actually studying it? Um, very little, actually, which might be a kind of surprising uh, response. Um, we kind of tend to give people the option of there is some sort of background reading that you can do if you're kind of champing at the bit and you really want to start on things. But we always kind of start week one with assuming no prior knowledge, really, which is, um, you know, because people will have studied lots of different periods of history. So someone might be kind of great on the Victorian period, but they've never studied anything kind of, you know, after... 1920 so um there's really kind of no point in assuming that everybody is kind of coming to us at the same point so from a history point of view we sort of say um have the best summer you can possibly have relax recharge your batteries um you know get enthusiastic about this new adventure that you're starting get in touch with us if you've kind of got any questions but we are absolutely not going to assume on day one that you oh my god i must already know x that's that's absolutely uh, not the kind of way that we begin so um if you come with a story to tell us about the great summer that you've had or the hilarious thing that happened to you on your summer job or something that you can kind of get the ball rolling when we do those icebreaker activities in induction week so that you get to know everybody else um i think you'll be well set excellent that sounds fine louise thank you i mean nigel i guess for your students they're coming in with their e-portfolios with evidence of of their kind of abilities what are you expecting for students when they start and can they do anything for your course to, to prepare very similar to what Louise said, really. Um, we have students come to us from a really wide range of different backgrounds. So some may have really strong digital skills. Some may have really good uh, technical drawing skills. Um, some may be more ideas people and have a very broad portfolio and not have any specialism. So a little bit like Louise, we want to treat people, um, you know, um, with the idea that actually we, we are 
the first year of our course is very broad and we sort of treat it as a little bit of a foundation in graphic design to um, orientate, orientate people to what the discipline is. So really we will work with anyone from any background of what sort of creativity they've uh, had before. So there's not really much they can do in the time period there is before starting university to actually um, set themselves up for anything. I suppose if, uh, like Louise says, if you want to do some background reading, things like that, that's all really, that's very good to do. There's lots of free blogs out there uh, that are excellent resources, things like Creative Review or Creative Boom or It's Nice That and, and blogs like that. They're good things just to um, get yourself um, to a stage where you have an understanding of sort of what contemporary graphic design or graphic illustration might be like, but there's no prerequisites. There's nothing that we would insist you doing. And, and, and we start day one as day one, basically. Brilliant. I mean, it's, it's impossible to have a conversation about anything without um, referencing the last 18 months. So everything's changed a bit in the last 18 months. And I think um, we're all, uh, so many people are talking about blended learning now and, and hybrid studies. What's it going to look like at Suffolk um, next academic year? Nigel, what does, what's graphic design going to feel like for students coming to join the course, having had a weird year? <laughs> um, Lots of being on campus um, is what we're planning for. Um, that studio environment is still there. That that and, and that will still be very much part of uh, what people go into in the industry. Um, so that ability to be able to work collaboratively with other people in studios is very important. We will be running some things online, but they will tend to be the things that uh, where we don't need your engagement so much. There more sort of like delivery of things or there might be some activities we might set for you to do in your own time um, at your leisure uh, within the next week before the next session comes along but certainly um, the experience uh, we, we've learned a lot from this year of, of doing things online which has been and we want to take the best of those things but um, the way that graphic design works best is gens to be in the studio and that's certainly what a lot of our second year and third year students uh, really want to get back to is being in the studio so yeah so so that's sort of going to be the main experience is, is going back to a studio based experience but was with some of those uh, beneficial things we've learned about over the last year of delivering things online um, that, that can be um, put in place as a, as additional things great and Louise what about history what's what's that going to look like this year yeah we're we're going for a blended uh, model so what that is going to mean in practice is um, our sort of teaching is, is sort of split between um, lectures, seminars, tutorials, workshops, um, and the lecture part of it is going to be um, online. And basically, that's actually kind of responding to student demand, um, which is our cohort tends to sort of be um, uh, drawn from the sort of uh, East Anglian region, really. And so uh, we have a number of people who commute in, um, some of them from even sort of South Norfolk, uh, North Essex, uh, as well as the kind of Suffolk region as well. And one of the things that students had said to us was, um, actually, it's really useful to be able to juggle with um, childcare and part-time jobs and just, you know, where I'm time of day I'm more awake um, and all sorts of things like that to be able to access um, the lecture which is basically where one of us uh, will be um, introducing students to a topic and so we will kind of be sort of running through the sort of introductory background and talking about some of the issues that we'll be kind of thinking about as a group in the seminar we're just kind of introducing them in, in that way and that means that you're going to have um, an online learning environment we call Brightspace, which is sort of like an internal um, internet area. I'm probably not explaining that in a very technical way. <laughs> but it's basically for every module that you do, you'll have this kind of internal website area that will kind of relate to that. And all of your lectures will kind of get posted on that. And basically, very similar to this, you'll kind of see a talking head um, and you'll see kind of lecture slides and you'll see um, videos and uh, various little kind of things that we're sort of doing and we'll kind of point you off to some interactive activities, you know, stop the lecture now, go and do this, then come back and think about this. 
Um, but you'll be able to do that at any time of the week that suits you really. So it's not the kind of same, I have to drive in and be there for Monday, 11 o'clock. And actually that's been one of the surprises, I suppose, from, from COVID that, that students have said, actually that really works with my lifestyle a lot better. The thing that students really love doing in person is the seminar bit. Um, and we absolutely agree with that. And we don't want to do that bit online because that's the discussion bit. That's the interactive bit. That's the sort of um, students getting together to kind of talk about um, primary sources that they've looked at, readings that they've looked at, have debates, do role play, um, all the kind of various things that you really kind of can't do online. So um, that bit will kind of be in person, tutorials, workshops, you know, when sometimes we need to be over in the, the hold, the new Suffolk Record Office um, space where clearly if you're kind of dealing with primary sources and going to kind of look at, at sort of 200 year old documents, um, you can't really, you know, you want to be in there, you want to be able to kind of touch things. So there are parts of it that will be online, um, there will be parts of it that will be in person and hopefully it will be a good blend. I'm glad you mentioned the hold there, Louise, um, because for, for students who've been onto the campus before, um, they might not have seen the hold since it's opened, because I think it's opened through the last year and a half since um, the world has gone crazy. So tell us about this new building on the campus and what it means for studying history at Suffolk. Mm. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's exciting for history students, but actually, you know, I want to kind of flag up, it's exciting for lots and lots of different students, actually, because there's all sorts of uh, opportunities to, to work with the whole. But essentially, when, if you hopefully come to the open day on the, the 14th of August, um, as you're kind of walking towards the main uh, campus waterfront building, immediately opposite that, you'll see uh, a lovely brand new building, um, which is being called The Hold. Um, it is the home of Suffolk Record Office, uh, Suffolk Archives, and they have documents there dating back a thousand years. Um, they have permanent exhibition space. We have some of our classes in there. We've I've kind of had my timetable through in the last week and very excited to see that some of our seminars are actually going to be being held in The Hold. Um, we have um, a what we kind of call it a, a sort of professional placement uh, module where students do um, work experience with Suffolk Archives. Um, and last year, uh, a lot of them were involved in the Pride in Suffolk um, exhibition, which was all about the um, LGBT uh, community within Suffolk and kind of looking at their history and put together, you know, fabulous exhibition, um, a, a kind of book that went with it. Um, they were in, they were on uh, BBC Suffolk talking about it. And it's those sorts of things that I think um, we've always worked with Suffolk Archives to do those sorts of things but being actually on campus uh, means students can get in there for dissertation research, they can do the sort of work placements, they can um, you know enjoy the kind of uh, sort of lecture and seminar facilities, I think there'll be all sorts of things but I think um, I, I know some of the uh, childhood studies, for example, uh, groups, they kind of work with, they've got, got collections of toys uh, through the ages and kind of thinking about, you know, the way that kind of childhood has, has changed. Um, I think there are, you know, opportunities for students from, from lots of different mm -hmm. uh, backgrounds to kind of work with the kind of facilities that, that they kind of have there. As a, um, as a graduate of sociology um, a long time ago, um, I think there's a, a massive interest for sociologists and the kind of data that you can get from the archives as well. So you're absolutely right to say it's, it's certainly not just history, it's, it's a really exciting building and resource for us all. Um, Nigel, I'm, I'm enjoying the physical hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just to say, you know, on the back of the hold, uh, we had some students working with them as one of our second year live projects uh, where we work with uh, uh, clients on a live brief and they've been doing the design and the identity for an exhibition that's coming up in October. So if you do join us, then look out for that exhibition and the graphics that surround that will have been done by some of our second year students. So um, I wholeheartedly uh, support uh, uh, what Louise has been saying about the hold. It's, it's a fantastic resource. It's, it's certainly an example of, um, of some of the developments happening around the university. We've obviously had the hold open relatively recently. We've got our new Digitech Centre, which has opened up at um, Adastral Park, where BT is based up in Martisham, um, that lots of our computing students will be using. Um, and we're working on the Health and Wellbeing Quarter, which opens on campus 
during the next academic year for our professional health and sports science students. So there's a lot of exciting things going on on the campus and um, we're certainly looking forward to showing people all of those things both on the 14th of August but then for students looking a bit later um, coming into the, the main open days in October and November as well. Um, so if you're looking later sign up for the open days and come and see all the new buildings. Um, Sophie, I feel like I've completely neglected you over the last few while as we've been talking clearing. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about what it was like for you starting university, how you kind of prepared, what it was like coming in that first couple of weeks and meeting people and just starting to become a University of Suffolk student? Um, so the way I prepared, I think, was just joining um, the Facebook group University of Suffolk Starters page and just following like the university on social media and things like that. Um, because that way um, you can like write on there, like is anyone else studying like paramedic science? And like you can like meet, so then anyone comments and then you can like create a little group chat and you can meet the people that are gonna be on your course before you actually start. Um, same as accommodation, you can be like, is anyone in this flat? And then you can meet your flatmates as well. Um, so that's really helpful, um, good way to start socialising. And then when you get here as well, um, if you didn't know about the Facebook page before, um, you can just, you've got an induction week, um, which I spoke about earlier, and you, it's a good way to get to know the, know the lecturers, get to know other people in your course as well. Um, lots of icebreakers. Um, so yeah, it feels a bit awkward at first, but you just, I feel like I just say to everyone, you just got to throw yourself into it and uh, just make the most of everything. Um, obviously you've got a freshers week as well, um, which is student, student union run. Um, and there's loads of different events. So like different nights out, like paintballing, um, go-karting, just to name like a few different things. Um, lots of societies and social sports as well. Um, but everything's on the website. So I feel like you just need to like do some Googling just before you start and following social media and everything's out there. You just need to find it. Excellent, thank you. Um, and when you were here, I mean, a lot of students, particularly over the summer, whether they're coming through clearing or just kind of preparing to start, will worry about the academic experience and if they're ready for studying at university and you know taking their studies to, to the next level. How did you find that transition and what kind of support did you access while you were here? Um, so I personally actually found a degree easier than A-levels. Um, I really struggled with A-levels, I think just because you've got so many different subjects, but obviously for a degree or choosing a subject you're passionate about, that you really like and you've just got the one to focus on. So that aspect I found easier but then obviously there's lots of different stuff that I'd never done before as well. So referencing, didn't have a clue how to do it. Um, so there's actually people called Academic Support Advisors um, through the library. Uh, so you can book meetings with them, have a one-on-one. -on -one, um, and they literally, I just went and was like, help, I have no clue what I'm doing. And they just gave me a sheet of paper. and I literally just used that for every single essay I wrote and just followed it. Um, and they can, you can go to them if like English is your second language, um, if you need help like you're dyslexic, um, if you need help planning, like if you've been given an essay title, you just have no clue where to start, you can go to them and be like, <laughs> what do I do? So you can go to them, they're really, really helpful. Um, they can like read uh, like a paragraph um, before you actually submit your essay as well. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend them. There's lots of support and like lecturers are happy to stay like after the lecture for like five minutes. So if you have had a question that you like, didn't want to ask in front of everyone else, you can just be like, I quickly ask you this, um, they're more than happy to. Brilliant, thanks Sophie. Um, Jenny, I take it as being part of the student life team, you must play a big part in helping people find support. You know, when people come to the university and they don't really know anything about what they're doing, how do they, what, how, how do you help them find out what to do and where to get help? I always say if you need help and you don't know where to start, start with the student life team. Uh, it's our job to signpost all the other departments. Um, if we can't answer it ourselves, that is, um, then we can signpost all the other departments that are available to you. So there is lots of support for students um, within the wider student life team. There are student finance advisors. So if you are having any problems with your student finance or it's not quite stretching as far as you'd hoped. Um, we also have disability and wellbeing and mental health advisors. So if you are having um, any issues going on in your personal life, maybe you need a bit of support there. Um, they can also help with if you think you might be dyslexic, dyspraxic or one of the other um, many specific learning disabilities out there, they can um, 
they can work with you, see if you need to be screened. And then if you are diagnosed with something officially, we can then put extra support in place um, through reasonable adjustments at the university and one-to-one -one support through learning services as well. Um, we do also have a chaplaincy team. Um, so they are there for um, multi-faith religions and also for people with no faith at all as well. Um, so you, they, they offer a quiet space that you can go and, and sit in if you do, just need a time out in the day. Um, so yeah, there, there is lots of support there. I haven't mentioned them all because I've forgotten some. There's careers team. Uh, so that there is lots and lots of support out there. So if you really are stuck and you don't know where to start, just come to the uh, Student Life Centre in the Waterfront Building and say, help, this is me, who do I go to? And we can point you in the right direction. Excellent. Thanks, Jenny. It's uh, coming towards the end of our time. So we have had one other question come in um, from Everista about um, international students looking at doing postgraduate nurse nursing. Um, please just um, drop us an email and we can so we can talk about what it is exactly that your friend is wanting to study, um, because I'm, I'm not exactly what you're looking for just from that. Um, we do a whole range of postgraduate health courses. Uh, so just drop us an email. And we can have a chat. Um, Guys, I'm going to finish off with some top tips, I think. Um, so can you give me your top tip for clearing, for getting started, you know, life in general, whatever you want to say, let, let's have a, a top tip to finish with. So I'm going to go alphabetical again, which means Holly, you're first. Uh, top tip. I think my top tip and something I say to lots of people calling up is you have, you literally have nothing to lose by applying. If you're applying, don't get a place. We'll give you advice on what to do next. But if you're applying, do get offered a place so you can then decide what you want to do next. Good tip. Thanks very much, Holly. Uh, Jenny. I'm going to give a top tip for those who are thinking of living in accommodation. Um, bring something personal with you from home, something that reminds you of home, friends and families, um, just so that you don't feel homesick. And if you do feel homesick, that is completely normal. Just contact the Student Life Centre or the Students' Union and get involved. Great tip. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Louise. Um, I suppose my top tip would be to ask lots and lots of questions and get as much of the information as possible. I think one of the things that people often don't fully appreciate about universities is how different different universities are from each other so um, a graphic design course a history course at different universities they they will have things in common of course but there will be lots of content that is quite different and so i think you know go to open days attend events like this email the tutors um outside of uh, time we're always happy to kind of respond ask lots and lots of questions because if you get it right, going to university should be one of the most enjoyable, exciting experiences of your life and kind of open up horizons, all sorts of things. So it's worth just taking a bit of time, asking lots of questions and then trust yourself because, you know, your gut will usually kind of tell you where you're going to feel happy. And, and we always kind of think where you feel happy is where you're going to do your best work and everything is going to come together. So trust yourself we are not making that decision for you your friends your parents whoever are not making that your life your decision trust yourself ask lots of questions it will turn out right excellent tip thanks louise nigel to sort of ride on the coattails of louise's um comment about questions is to say there are no stupid questions um don't be afraid to ask questions don't be afraid to put yourself forward for thing to to ask questions about things um there's no judgment on our side of, about those sorts of things we're there to help and support you we understand how difficult being at university can be for people who may be moving away from home for the first time or or people coming back to study for the first time after you know being in, in work for a while and those sorts of things and there truly that all, all the tutors I've ever worked with always believe there are no stupid questions so so just ask and um, and someone will be pleased to uh, try and help you and and if and I suppose if you're thinking it um, then I'm sure there's lots of other people who are thinking it as well so just ask exactly great thanks Nigel Sophie um, I'd say just put yourself out there take yourself out of your comfort zone and just try and meet as many people as, as possible really. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to finish with my top tip of come and see us on Saturday the 14th of August, which is our clearing open event. We're open 10 till 2. You can register on the website in advance. You can also just turn up, but obviously registering in advance is quite helpful just to make sure you get all the updates as to what's happening. Um, also come and see us um, on one of our campus tours, which you can do from the website. Um, just let us know you want to come and have a look around and we shall put you in touch with our academic team so you can see the facilities as well. And I'm also just going to finish with reminding you to follow us on social media. Um, we are everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn and TikTok. So whatever it is, however you want to follow us, just follow us. All five of them is fine too. Um, we've really enjoyed um, having lots of chat today. I've enjoyed having all of your questions come in. So thank you everybody for asking questions as we've gone through. Hopefully you all found it really helpful. Um, and if you are interested in applying to the University of Suffolk to join us in this autumn, um, please just give us a call um, and visit our clearing um, pages on the website as well. It's just us.ac.uk forward slash clearing. You can apply, submit an inquiry online, but you can also phone us to have a chat through your options as well. So good luck, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, team, for all of your answers. And we shall be back Facebook Live next week.